It's likely the end of a long journey that has captivated China and the world. A herd of wild Asian elephants in China's southwest has finally arrived at a place where they are more familiar with. They left their forest home in Yunnan Sichuanbana Nature Reserve in March last year and started a long journey north. But late last year, the herd drew attention when it started moving into human settled areas. They became a global sensation, with millions checking on them every day. On Sunday, they crossed the Yuanjiang River and are now in a protected enclosure. Here's a look back at the herd's travel. In March 2020, a herd of 16 wild Asian elephants left their home at the Xishuangbana National Nature Reserve, heading northward. In July 2020, the herd entered the Simao district of the city of Puar. On April 24, two in the group returned to Mojang County. On May 27, the elephants came upon the town of Eshan in Yusei City and walked the streets for six hours. On June 2, the herd arrived in the Chining district of the provincial capital of Kunming. On June 4, the Jumbo Club changed direction and took 6.6 .6 kilometers southwest instead of heading north. June 21, the herd re-entered Eshan County, traveling southward. July 27, they entered Yuanzhuang County in the city of Yuxi. August 8, the herd crossed the Yuanzhuang River with some intervention, returning to a suitable habitat. For more on the World Elephant Day and the wandering elephants going back home in Yunnan, we have Ahimsa Kampo Arfez, who is in Xishuangbana right now. He's a principal investigator at the Xishuangbana Tropical Botanical Garden, who specializes in elephant also professor of Chinese Academy of Sciences. In Chiang Rai, John Roberts, director of the Golden Triangle Asian Elephant Foundation. Last but not least in Hong Kong, Kyle Oberman, conservation photographer and writer. Good to see you, Kyle. I love that backdrop with all the snowy mountains. I hope you'll be back soon. But anyway, let's start about the elephant, Ahimsa. You, of course, have the latest information in Yunnan. Tell us more. Hello, Tianwei. Very good seeing you. And, good to and see you. And happy World Elephant Day to everyone. <laughs> well, the elephants are now getting closer, than, much closer than the last time we talked. They, they crossed the, the Yuanjian River this week. But they are still not in, in Shishuanbana. They, they are still a bit far away from the nature reserve. So and right now, the elephants are, we will say, close to the natural habitat. They are in the area of uh, of Mojang, where they were also at the end of last year. Okay, well, that is only after quite a few months of traveling already, and the world is following the story, isn't it, Kyle? Yeah, they are indeed. I, I've seen the international headlines all about it, and I've even covered it um, for the China Current as well. So it's been, I know some of the drone footage of the elephants sleeping together was kind of a, an image that was went all around the world, viral all across very quickly. So it's been a Really amazing story um, that the whole world follows. And John, you are in Thailand, but certainly you are also following the story given your job of uh, doing things with the elephants. In far north Thailand, we, we may even be closer to uh, Sichuanbana than, than Kunming. So the elephants may have gone, if they had come in this direction, they may have crossed three countries and landed on our, uh, on our land. So um, yes, very, very close and very interested and, and certainly with the rest of the world following to see what uh, See, see what these elephants are, are doing and where they're going. Yeah, indeed. If you think about that, you know, saga in a way, it's, it's very interesting uh, what they have done and also the others, uh, you know, the human beings have been doing to keep a wayward 
uh, the elephants safe in their, on their way home. 25,000 police and staff were working to make sure they stay on track. It also took more than 15,000 vehicles, emergency vehicles, 900 drones, and 180 tons of food to guide the elephants home. Meanwhile, more than 150,000 people have been evacuated to clear the path. I also heard there are several millions of yuan being used as the evacuation fees and compensation fees for those on the road of the elephants. But the question really is, is it worth it? There are a, a dozen elephants. Uh, so are we going to see these stories once and again, Ahimsa? I think it's absolutely worth it, not only because of these elephants per se, but because of what we are learning. I think to me this has been a, a kind of a, a game changer situation in which we have invested a huge amount of attention and resources on accommodating the movement of these elephants. And we have learned a lot in the process. We have learned the complexities of conserving a growing mm. a population of, of megafauna in such highly fragmented landscapes. But I also want to become personal in a way because Ahimsa, you are just mm. a few you know, miles away from the elephant. Actually, they were at your door, at your exactly where you are today. Yes. Uh, tell me more about those moments. I had the experience of, of dealing with this in two ways. One as, a, as an elephant expert and as a researcher, but also as a person who lives here and whose, you know, my apartment was next to where elephants were and affected my daily routines. So it, it was really, really important to see the other side of it, not yeah. only the academic side, but you know, how, how it feels when suddenly elephants come to your, to your backyard and suddenly you cannot move freely. You cannot move at night in some areas, so you have to take <laughs> extra precautions. But they could, and, right? <laughs> and even, even feeling a bit of fear. Mm. And very intense monitoring. It was can, can you hear them roar? Uh, did you see some of the photos uh, of them resting or you know, walking in your area? Uh, how, how is it like for you, you know, particularly as an expert researching about the elephant? Well, again, for me, it was a, was a great opportunity because first, it happened in our, in, you know, in our garden. Uh, this botanical garden is, is, a, is a center for reference for conservation biology. And then, then we, we have some of the, of the leading experts in Asia in, in, in wildlife conservation or biodiversity conservation. So then we had to have a response that was, of course, dealing with safety, both of elephants and people yeah. first. But also we had to add value for conservation. We need to do something that is not just just kind of uh, dealing with the problem short term. So what thinking did you about do? How we can learn something and contribute? Well, what we did is design a plan in which we we decide uh, where elephants can use in the future. We have a it's kind of secondary forest and, and some uh, forest plantations so when people monitor different aspects of uh, forest uh, ecology and, and and forest management. So those things, it has, it has consequences for people who do the research in these areas. But we agree that if elephants come back in the future, they can use that area. Just yeah. we will create a physical barrier that elephants cannot mm. cross. So then we are sure that elephants will not come into, into the dangerous areas when they come in the future. Most likely, elephants have joined the garden. And now we are the only botanical garden in the world that has, has elephants as part wow. of the the you know the native uh, wildlife population I'm, I'm really jealous of you i'm sure kyle feel the same way being a photographer looking you know usually through his lens at the great nature and all the wild uh, animals uh, kyle what was that moment like for you when you heard the story and how do you see the saga in a way uh, the the pleasant saga shall i say uh, of this story as I heard the story, I was very interested, you know, obviously from a conservation standpoint, from a, from a selfish standpoint, you're totally right. I was, I really wish I could have been there with the drone and following the story because I think that, you know, looking at how the elephants and the humans interact as they go, and as you said, Timmy, the efforts put in by the Chinese government and all the people and personnel involved in the whole process, I mean, this was really, I think, an unprecedented effort mm. to accommodate these elephants, which you know, is a fascinating visual story. Uh, and I think you know, the images we saw from it were only a little bit of what happened, uh, but you know they were incredibly hard touching by themselves alone. So, you know, I think um, it, yeah, but you know, the images that came out, especially again, you know, the aerial footage, you know, the, the showing of kind of like you know, we would expect with like human snuggling, you know, like a mother and her child. You know, I think it really <laughs> touched a lot of people's hearts and re really connected people to the story and, and to these animals. Right. If you were there, what would you wish that you would do? 
Well, I, you know, I, as as a photographer and you know a person documenting China's conservation, I, I would again I would really look at how China facilitated their migration north around all of these people. I mean, obviously China, you know, is the most populous country in the world, and across China in any conservation project, you know, they're balancing uh, how to you know allow nature and people to coexist. One of the crucial questions we still need to ask, even today, I know we debated about a half a year already, but still today, what exactly is the reason or what are the reasons why the elephants are coming out of what we consider, human beings consider, as their home and wandering into other areas? And, well, many debate that whether it's a coincidence, but others have pointed out reasons. Ahimsa, you earlier cited some of these reasons. Uh, would you like to give a more comprehensive answer, though, you know, more targeted answer? Yes, I have spent the last few months <laughs> working on this and thinking about this. Mm. We can say that this is unusual, but it's not very, very surprising, okay? What was very surprising is that elephants, once they left the reserve, they went all the way to Kumei. That is, that is exceptional, and maybe, maybe it was a kind of a freak situation that we will not see anytime soon again. But let's focus on why elephants are leaving the preserve. So this, this, is, this has to do with multiple factors that have been going on for a long time. One is that the elephant population has been growing, and, and Kai was mentioning how the, the elephant population has, has almost doubled since the 1980s. So as you have more elephants in a small space, there is more competition. So at some point, some elephants need to go somewhere else because they are competing with each other for, for limited resources. At the same time, in this period, within the nature reserves, there has been a growth of forest density. Because there is less human disturbance, the canopy has grown. And when the canopy grows and the, the forest becomes more dense, right. there is less food for elephants because elephants feed from food on the ground, but the canopy covers the blocks the light, and then there's light, less light coming in. Mm. And elephants don't like very much old growth forest. So then as the as the forest becomes better. Elephants like it less. So the elephants will move outside the reserve where they find more open areas and more food. So these two things have been happening for a long time. And then we can expect that, that once a while, some elephants will abandon the reserve and establish somewhere else. Mm. But something that happened between March 2019 and, and May 2020 was a very severe drought. Okay? There was an extreme drought is the, the, the most uh, severe drought in the last 50 years in the region. So I can imagine that this kind of uh, intra-specific competition right. and, and kind of shortage of food was, was aggravated. And then these two elephant herds, the one that went to Kuming and the elephant that came to, to the, our gardens, decided to leave at the same time, sometime around March, 20, March 2020. But this is something that we knew. And actually, I can say that, that that's the reason why I moved to China one year ago, was to study this situation of an elephant population that is growing. I see. While everywhere else in Asia, the elephant populations are shrinking, here we know the elephant population has been growing for, for some time, and this presents new challenges, OK? Then why elephants went to Kunming? That is much more difficult to, to answer. Right. And I think we will never really know for sure, because elephants are intelligent. They can make decisions, and, and it's, it's not you know, they, they, they can make very, very complex decisions. So then I assume that that has to do a bit with uh, with chance events, with, with fragmentation, elephants not finding a suitable place uh, once mm -hmm. they left the, the reserve. Yes. Curiosity, you know, exploring new areas, being, being followed by many people, which probably accelerated the movements. Once they went into Yushi, sometime in May, they, they move very fast to Kunming. So I think there were a number of circumstances that, that drove this situation I and see. made it so spectacular. But elephants coming out from the reserve is expectable, and we will continue seeing this in the next decades. John, are you noticing similar situations where you are in the Golden Triangle, or things quite different? As Ahimsa said, the numbers of elephants are growing in China. Well, maybe in other parts of Asia near the earlier habitat, may not necessarily. So tell me more about this reality, this, where you are. Yeah, it's worth remembering, um, just to add to what Ahimsa said, that if since time immemorial elephants would would flow through a landscape so as, mm. as he says leaving reserves 
is, is not uncommon. In fact, the idea of having a reserve is, is another human idea that was put together as Very human true. populations grew. So yeah. we are seeing similar, um, not not here in the Golden Triangle, but further mm -hmm. south, there are, there's a large herd of elephants that has been running around uh, what's called the five provinces um, down in, in what I call the lower northeast. Uh, and they, they have been operating almost outside, entirely outside protected areas for, for several, um, almost a year now. Um, and and operating in a similar way, not necessarily going into uh, into the villages, although there is always there's a sort of what I call low scale human elephant conflict, right. and Thailand hasn't poured the resources into it that, that China did, but for, for various reasons, um, uh, particularly because I think they have they have more of these herds moving around, so they they could you know, as I say most countries couldn't afford to do what China has done. Let, let me go to you, Kyle. Uh, also about that, I mean, it seems that the other two gentlemen have already mentioned several factors. You know. Uh, whether the habitat is good enough for the wild elephants and, and also the, uh, ch the human beings expanding their living space, you know, the different kinds of habitat and also uh, the uh, urbanization, uh, many factors that might have an impact. Uh, tell me more about your thoughts on the elephant story. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to change my virtual background here. Oh, sure. I'm going to use my, my, <laughs> use my Zoom. First of all, I want to be more tropical, so I match everyone else. But this uh, this photo is actually from the Sichuan Banan National Nature Reserve. Um, yeah. And I think it tells a lot about what China has done and where the struggles are. So uh, over here on my left is the National Nature Reserve. You know, the forest is, you know, original, old growth, at least secondary growth, but obviously preserved and very well intact. And on the right here is actually a rubber plantation farm, which in Yunnan is very common um, all across Southeast Asia as well. So mm. one, you know, from my perspective as a photographer, it's really visible how habitat is being protected and how habitat is being changed. We have a monoculture forest, uh, you know, that doesn't, you know, you can tell the rows on the mountainside. So, you know, it, it's going to be fascinating as the elephants have grown and the population has, you know, almost doubled. Where are they going to go next? Mm. Um, you know, is there space for them to go? Is there wild lands outside of the National Nature Reserves? Um, and as we've seen, for example, the Hongzhan Mountains or in Qinghai, where I work, China is now working on a new national park system, uh, mm. which has been you know, incredibly exciting. And some of the new pilot parks are focusing on animals. Now, actually, they're considering uh, implementing an Asian elephant national park. And what's very interesting and cool about this story is that about five years ago, they actually proposed for this park to happen, uh, but it really wasn't taken up, at least the news kind of stopped. Uh, but because of this story of the elephants migrating north and, you know, kind of, you know, and, and meeting humans, now suddenly the, El the Asian Elephant National Park is in the news again, and you see it uh, being reconsidered on all different levels, which is exactly what we want to see, I think, and exactly what's so exciting about a story like this getting mm -hmm. a lot of coverage mm -hmm. um, and, and emotional investment is that then you see action. So now they're considering actually building an Asian Elephant National Park. Right. There are almost 500,000 people living inside the area. So it's, again, it's still a question of how do you build the wildlife corridors? How do you balance your human needs and nature? Uh, but I think it's going to go down a similar path uh, that China is building its national parks and other areas as well, which will be yeah. very exciting and mm. even more resources. The next question I want to ask the three of you, gentlemen, that is, you know, we human beings can make huge determination to do something. But what we do today still is not the nature as it was to the elephants or to the wildlife, uh, no matter how much we try. Uh, also, there are uh, different factors in, that's kind of likely to influence what we are going to do. For example, some of the natural reserves have becoming more, um, shall we say, a natural park. Um, so how, how do you see on the one hand that we really need to set up now a holistic system to protect the wild animals, whether it's wild elephant or wild leopard or, or others. On the other hand, make sure that system will be sustainable in other words, it will not just be money coming from the central and the provincial government, but it can be sustainable on its own so that it will continue. So, so these are very important policy questions 
to be asked. Ahimsa, I'm sure during the past uh, half a year, you've been thinking a lot about that. Yes, and I think that that's in something very important. I think we, we need to acknowledge that uh, we are in the Anthropocene. We live in a time in which humans dominate ecosystems. We have to live with wildlife like elephants or leopards in human dominated landscapes. And we need to find ways to balance the presence, balance conservation and also protection of people's interests. Yeah. We have to think that around 70% of the wild Asian elephant population in the world or in Asia lives outside protected areas. Okay, so then it is common, it is, it is normal for elephants to live in outside protected areas next to people. How do we deal with the problems that comes with having a growing elephant population? Because there will be massive problems coming when elephants reach new areas. Mm. When elephants establish in a new county or in a, in a new village, people will have a, economic consequences, safety consequences, and elephants can do very well. Elephants are extremely adaptable, so now the point for me are two priorities to deal with this situation. One is uh, protecting people from elephants. You know, elephants that continue growing and continue expanding, they will have a negative impact on people living next to them. We need to make sure that people are safe and that the, you know, the livelihood is not highly compromised by, by the presence of elephants. Otherwise, they will not support conservation. And if the local communities yeah. don't support conservation, we don't have conservation. And second, we have to think about how we can promote more habitat with low human presence. Elephants are really, really adjustable. They don't need very high quality habitat. What they need is, is less conflict with people. So then if we can promote policies that, you know, we encourage people to move into, into higher density areas. Uh -huh. uh, just to add to that a little bit to create more discussion before I go to uh, Kyle, is that many of the nature reserves are actually moving up in terms of altitude, because human beings are living in more and more spaces. Uh, but whether that is exactly where the wild elephants used to be and like to be, that's another question, uh, or other wild animals as well. So how to deal with that? You can't just say, well, people have to move out of every area. That's impossible because we have to be re realistic. But on the other hand, how to make sure that coexistence could be natural and could be peaceful and could be beneficial for both yeah. sides? That's fascinating. Kyle, your thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a very interesting question, especially if the population continues to increase. I think one of the things that needs to happen is also really thinking about sustainable ecological tourism and moving on, you know, past just seeing elephants in zoos, but, you know, really experiencing elephants in their natural habitat, you know, can China develop sort of ecological tourism that Africa has, you know, that, that can support local livelihoods where people, you know, if the elephants are wanting to expand their habitat, okay, and so you need to reclaim habitat and rewild land, and the people are going to need income. So mm. they can move to the city, that's a possibility, or you know, China has the uh, grain for green programs, you know, payment for ecosystem services. This could be a possibility, or perhaps these people become rangers, like they've become in the, uh, in, in, in the Tibetan Plateau in the Three Rivers National Park, um, and they're paid to now become rangers and to guide people on ecological tours that look at the flora and the fauna, yeah. and to guide people to watch the elephants in their habitat undisturbed. I think that would be, one thing that could potentially solve this is how to you know, accommodate their, their expansion across China's populated areas. Uh, Kyle, I know you have a lot of thoughts because I've been reading your articles. You were excited when the story happened. <laughs> the elephants, as long as there's room, you know, their population will keep increasing. So in, in a sense, like I think we're going to run up into an issue. And I wonder, my question maybe, you know, has there been cases of, okay, like, let's say we want to cap the elephant population in China at 400. Can we relocate elephants to other areas in Southeast Asia where there's less? I don't know. I'm not the expert. <laughs> you know, I know with some species that are a lot smaller, it's possible, yeah. you know, but elephants are quite big and hard to move. So I think that would be my question. Yeah, well, I guess uh, both John and Ahimsa have to answer that question. John, go to you first. Uh, I mean, uh, 
I think uh, Kyle touched on ecotourism. That's that that is something that can go, but I don't see that as a, as an answer in the same way as it is in Africa, unfortunately, because there are just we're dealing with with too many people. Um, I, I mean, the, the first of all, that national parks moving up. In fact, elephants in in Bhutan and uh, northeast northeast India, elephants seem to be moving up as well as national parks. Uh, as, as, as humans, as there's more elephant human pressure in the lowlands, elephants seem to be moving up in altitude and they're, they're perhaps better protected in Bhutan. And the other point I was going to make is um, with, with Carl's photograph there, um, although it's actually disastrous for almost all the ecosystem, it's not that disastrous for elephants uh, because elephants can move through rubber plantations and tea plantations and this the low human density, uh, low human density uh, agriculture fairly well. Um, and what's happened in northeast India and presumably can happen in China, possibly already is, is in order to aid the elephant moving from one spot of good good forest and good for them forest to another, um, through these rubber plantations or tea plantations, um, if we could have guidelines to make sure that those areas are safe. So with people, how they react when they see a herd of oh. elephants. Um, things like don't leave pesticide and pesticide laced water unattended and there are a series of guidelines that are being developed in northeast india where the human population density is much higher as well to uh, to allow certain uh, it's been adopted by certain tea gardens that allows elephants to, to move through yeah. uh, through the uh, through the tea mm. ahimsa what about that beyond the border uh, uh, migration well i think that that is really important we need to have more connectivity I think the priority now should be also to make sure the population is not isolated because 300 elephants is small population, as you know, in terms of the population dynamics, is not what we consider a long term viable population. Normally, as a rule of thumb, we talk about uh, 500 uh, effective breeding individuals. So, but if we, can, if we can connect the China population, particularly Nangohe, which is isolated right now with uh, elephants in Laos and Myanmar, that would be fantastic. I think with Myanmar, it's difficult at the moment. With Laos, there's a bit of movement at, at this moment, but it would be great to have more collaboration with, with Laos to promote mm -hmm. the connectivity on that side. And then if we can have the population being, being a single population from China all the way to where, where John is, that would be much, much better in the long term. What does it take for that kind of cooperation to happen? It's already going on to some extent. Uh, China and Laos, uh, they have been in the last 14 or 15 years doing a joint management and, and monitoring of the of the border in Shishonbana, between Shishonbana and Laos and, and the Namha National Park in Laos. But I think uh, the problem is that in, in Laos, the, the human capacity, the, the amount of resources and law enforcement is much weaker. So I think it will, something very important is to train more people in Laos to make sure that they, they, they have good uh, staff qualified to do the, the, the monitoring, the implementation right. and the enforcement of the of the plans and regulations there. So that elephants can be safer. And then we'll have to also think about a spatial planning, you know, in terms of, of connecting national parks, not only as, as islands, but having corridors that connect all these national mm. parks, natural habitats. Right. All sounds fascinating ideas. On behalf of the program, I want to thank the three of you for being with us. Ahimsa, John, and Kyle, thank you so much for being with us. All the best. The elephant became an overnight internet sensation, not only in China, all over the world. In China, particularly, millions of Chinese kept a close eyes on the herd online, with some watching the animal eating, napping, showering through a 24-7 live streams and daily updates from the media. It also drew global citizens to check them as well. You know, there are so many stories about them that worth remembering. Before we wrap up today's program, we would like to leave all of you and our audience with some of those memorable moments.